Um, I was just saying that I wish that I were joining you tonight to give you good environmental news, but the fact is I can't and, and no one can, because when it comes to climate, the evidence is in. Hopefully you will all remember, uh, just to take the most recent evidence, that uh, just before the summer began, India and Pakistan were burning up. Then we went into breaking heat records in the United States, in Europe, and in China. First time in human history that three continents break heat records exactly at the same time simultaneously. And then, of course, we went into Pakistan being flooded, and it still is substantially flooded. So just to take the evidence from the past few months, the evidence on climate change is in. The science is in, not only for climate, but also for the interrelated biodiversity crisis. The economics is in. Renewables are hands down competitive against the incumbent fossil fuels. And of course, there will be ongoing questioning. There are other crises that need to be handled. There will be and is currently a lot of scrutiny of the plans and the intents and the commitments. There are legal and regulatory setbacks, you name it, all to be expected in the course of the greatest transformation of our time. So we cannot underestimate the complexity or the difficulty of that transformation. At the same time, however, that complexity cannot paralyze us. We cannot stand forever in admiration of the problem. We must stand up, step up, and step forward. We must nurture our conviction that the world can be better if we change our behavior patterns. We must develop the confidence that we can address this crisis if we are unswervingly intentional about it. We must recognize that action is urgent, exciting actually, necessary and full of opportunity. Now, I don't think I have to tell this audience that culture is just as important as science and politics, but neither scientists nor politicians are in any strong position to lead it. We have scientific reports up the gazoo. We have political manifestations and commitments out the gazoo. And they are in fact setting out the direction of travel, but they cannot deliver the ethos, the heart of the matter, the excitement of the better world that we can create if we set our minds to it. Those reports, science, politics, are admittedly comprehensive and factual, full of data. But let's be honest, they do not spark our imagination, let alone trigger our ingenuity to do something different. So the 2015 Paris Agreement that Alex has alluded to uh, arguably represents the highest integrity of human spirit. However, despite its very ambitious goal of reaching a global economy of net zero by 2050, we're currently witnessing a widening gap between efforts and actual scientific requirements, between greenhouse gas emissions and the planet's tolerance of those emissions. Politicians and Climate scientists refer to that gap as the emissions gap, which it is and has been quantified and continues to be quantified. However, tonight we should remember it is also a culture gap. It is a gap between where we are and where we need to be inside of us, who we understand ourselves to be. It is a gap between what we think we can do and what we need to do. And friends, I have to tell you that no industry is better positioned to close that human gap, that culture gap, than the film and creative industry. As you have seen over the past 10 days, and 
just to not leave anybody in the audience out, no one can better take that possibility from the silver screen to the kitchen table. No one can do that better than those of you who appreciate the magic of powerful environmental films. In addition to the human tragedy that we're witnessing in the Ukraine, we're also witnessing the irresponsible weaponization of oil and gas on the part of Russia. And that is threatening global energy security, driving energy and food prices sky high, lining the pockets of oil and gas companies, and the worst of all consequences, putting millions of people back into abject poverty when they had just barely come out of the poverty line. That is a stark reminder that we have to stay razor sharp, focused on the compelling reality that addressing climate crisis through clean, affordable, predictably priced, domestically produced energy is the only route to peace. No other path leads us to national and international peace. We are in the midst of the most consequential human choice we will ever make. Let me put it this way. Some of you will remember those old TV shows that had, do you want door one or door number two? Which door do you choose? Well, let's take that concept and understand that we as humanity, as a human race, we are now faced with two doors. And we're being asked to choose between those two doors, consciously or unconsciously, but we are choosing. Now, if we go on the path to door number one, which means business as usual, everybody continues doing what they're doing, no, you know, no, no um, radical transformation, then by 2030, and that's just a little bit over seven years from now, we will have reached that door. We will not have reduced greenhouse gas emissions by 50%, which is what science demands. And we will walk through that door. And once we're through that door in 2030, we have committed ourselves and all our descendants to a world of constantly increasing destruction and human misery that we cannot even imagine. Now, the good news is we're not condemned to door number one. We have the option of walking toward door number two, but that has to be an intentional choice. Door number two is to understand that we all have the responsibility to cut our emissions by 50% between now and 2030, everyone. Every family, every person, every corporation, every institution, every state, every, every town, every city, every state. All of us have to cut our emissions by 50%. And if we do that, then we get to door number two in 2030, not only having averted the worst consequences of climate change that are behind door number one, but actually door number two opens the door to a world that is safer, healthier, much more efficient, and above all, much more fair, especially for the most vulnerable. So the film industry cannot be held responsible for the door that humanity chooses, obviously. But I would argue tonight that the film industry can powerfully illustrate that we have a choice, that we're making a choice, whether we're aware of making the choice consciously or not, we are choosing. And the film industry can powerfully illustrate the consequences behind that choice and behind each of those two doors. Now, happily, many people are already choosing door number two. As you have seen illustrated in some of the films in this festival, there are in fact, not just hundreds, but there are thousands, tens or hundred thousands, eco warriors out there, eco entrepreneurs who are already using their ingenuity to protect our home planet, to produce products and services that help to solve society's greatest problems, repairing and regenerating the planet on the way. So 
the film industry has a double task. It has the task of reminding us of the damage that we have already wrought and at the same time, driving collective urgent optimism into humankind's ingenuity and power to impact this decisive decade. And that optimism, my friends, has to be stubborn, gritty, defiant, because barriers and challenges, there will be many. Almost three years already into this most decisive decade, the number of climate fronts where humanity is failing are way too many. But if we slip into despair, into grief, into hopelessness and helplessness, the chance of our success are severely impeded. That is why we have to remember that the pen is mightier than the sword. The time to acknowledge the transformational power of gritty, courageous optimism and the power of positive inspiration storytelling is right now. So this is a call to arms. It's a call to arms to all of those who are holding the pen. And it is also a call to arms to all the rest of you who are concerned about our surrounding environment and can and should muster your inner resources to make a difference out there. This is the time to take the message from the silver screen to your kitchen table, to your families, to your work, to your companies, to your towns, to your cities. This is the time to become actively engaged. This is an all hands on deck moment. We cannot afford to delay more. So in closing, I would like to thank the filmmakers at this festival for all the work that you've already done and which have been on display during these 10 days. But I also hope that you will agree that we are far from normalizing these topics such that they're addressed not only on the silver screen, but at every kitchen table by every family, town, city, state, corporation, and financial institution. That is the task. That is the path ahead. Not easy, but frankly, we don't have any other option but door number two. The alarm clock is ringing, my friends. So it is time to stand up, step up, and step forward. Thanks.